this Easter, I have an Easter message that was inspired by a quotation that I saw on the Moon of Alabama blog. Now, in these geopolitically chaotic times, I do recommend reading the Moon of Alabama blog, which I've read for many years. On Moon of Alabama, post from 25 March of 2024, where the author of Moon of Alabama, Bernard, has a quotation there from Samuel P. Huntington. Now, when I quote Samuel P. Huntington, or when I talk about this quotation, it doesn't mean that I endorse everything that Samuel P. Huntington says about the world or his paradigm of understanding what's going on in the world, nor does it mean that Bernard of Moon of Alabama has any endorsement of the things that I say. He, he doesn't. I'm just telling you that this was a very thought-provoking quotation from Moon of Alabama blog of 25 April 2024. It is so thought-provoking and so important that I thought it would be a good stepping off point to some of the subjects that I'd like to address here as we approach the Easter season. I'm recording this in Australia on Thursday, which would be Maundy Thursday or the night of the Last Supper in Christian tradition, the day before Good Friday. Right now it's still Wednesday in California where I'm from. But these dates of Easter, of course, as I've pointed out many times, they're related to the motions of the sun and the moon. The date of Easter has to do with the equinox, the March equinox, and the full moon. And there's differences between the Western literalist churches and the Eastern literalist churches. That's why sometimes the celebration of Easter is an entire moon cycle off from one from the West to the East. But these are not literal events that they're celebrating. This is not a flesh and blood Jesus on a literal wooden cross. This is a pattern that is found in the ancient sacred stories around the world, as we'll touch on briefly in this Easter meditation. But first, let's take a close look at this quotation from Samuel P. Huntington, in which he says, quote, the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion to which few members of other civilizations were converted, but rather by its superiority in applying organized violence. Westerners often forget this fact. Non-Westerners never do. This is an image that shows the spread of Christianity throughout Europe. The spread of Christianity throughout Europe in the time of Charlemagne. What you see here is an illustration entitled The Destruction of the Ermensul by Charlemagne. The Ermensul is a sacred tree of the Germanic pre-Christian ancient traditional gods and goddesses. It's akin to Yggdrasil of the Norse myths, the world tree. It's the central pillar of the world. And this illustration shows either Charlemagne or a knight associated with Charlemagne with a cross hanging on a banner and a cross on top of the post that's holding up the banner, surrounded by soldiers in armor with their spears and clubs. And you can see that all around the men of the Germanic people who are being subdued here and converted at the point of a sword have their arms tied behind their back. The women and children don't, but basically the warriors have been bound and the military men who are chopping down the Irmansul and protecting those who are chopping down the Irmansul are going to convert these people at the point of the sword. It's either going to be get baptized or die. It's either going to be acknowledge the historicity and superiority of 
a Jesus, a literal flesh and blood Jesus who supposedly lived in history or die. That's the way that this religion was spread, not by superiority of its ideas or its conception, but by organized violence. This is how the West became Christian and then spread its ideas around the world, not by the inherent superiority of its message, but by the inherent superiority of its ability to organize violence, or you could say organize crime. At the time of Easter, what is being celebrated is the death and resurrection of a figure called Jesus, or Christ. That death and resurrection story is actually very beautiful very powerful, very profound, and very much esoteric. It is not literal. It's not about a literal, historical, flesh and blood Jesus with literal and historical flesh and blood disciples. That can be proven beyond any doubt. In fact, you can go to the scriptures themselves, the letters attributed to someone writing under the name of Paul, who says it over and over. In this passage from 2 Corinthians, he says, Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you. In meaning within. It's an internal teaching. This is telling us something about what's going on in you. Jesus Mary, the disciples, are all in you. This is all celestial metaphor. You can see it in the painting by da Vinci, the celestial features that are incorporated in this painting shows that it's metaphor. It doesn't happen on the earth with external flesh and blood figures. All the stories can be shown to be based on the stars. That means they're allegory. That means they're metaphor. What are they an allegory or a metaphor trying to explain or illustrate for us? What is the metaphor there for? It's showing the burial and suppression of your own self, your own divine self that is buried and separated due to trauma, just like in the story, but no matter how much trauma, no matter how many woundings, spear thrusts, scourging, crown of thorns, no matter what happened to your, in your life, in your internal landscape that caused that suppression and separation from self, the scriptures and the stories around the world, the myths around the world illustrate that no matter what kind of terrible things happened, self is actually indestructible, available, and present, that is a powerful, beautiful story. But Paul makes it very clear that is within you. That's what we're talking about here. And if you just turn the page from 2 Corinthians, that's from 2 Corinthians 13, 5. If you just turn the page to the very next book, that's the last chapter of Corinthians, then it goes into Galatians. In Galatians, Paul says, O oh, foolish Galatians! Having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? He's saying, what are you doing? I came there and explained to you about a Christ that is spirit, that's within you. And now I get this report that you have been seduced away to a flesh and blood historical teaching. What are you doing? He says, you foolish Galatians, how can you be so foolish? He says, this is Galatians 3, verse 1, and then verse 3. He says, you, how can you be that misguided? I can't believe how misguided you are being if you're being seduced away from what I taught you. I taught you the real teaching, and now you're going over to a flesh and blood teaching? Now, those are very powerful passages from within the scriptures themselves. This story of the 
buried and then resurrected Jesus is actually found in all the different myths around the world of a, uh, but using different metaphors, using different illustrations. It's not obviously using a Jesus and 12 disciples, but in ancient Egypt, of course, there's the story of Osiris. Osiris is dead and buried. That's why you see him here in a mummy wrappings with a green face with the goddess behind him in the illustration here from the temple at Abydos, which we're going to go see later this year in November. I hope you can join me and Ksenia and Patricia Alion Lehman in Egypt in November. We will go to Abydos and see this beautiful artwork illustrating the myths of ancient Egypt. They are teaching the same thing. Osiris was treacherously slain by his own brother, just like the self, the different parts of who we are suppress and bury our own self. It's a self-defense mechanism. It's because of trauma. But in the story of Osiris, he's betrayed, he is buried, he's cut up into pieces, he's scattered around. But no matter what happens to self, it's divine and it comes back. That's what these stories are showing. And in fact, the Osiris death and burial, the chopping down, he, he's associated with a tree. He's actually buried in a tree. And the Jed column of Osiris, the backbone of Osiris is cast down. The tree gets chopped down. And, then, and that's also shown at Abydos, by the way. And then comes back. It's very much akin to the Irmansul that we see being chopped down. The same imagery is found in the ancient myths and scriptures and artwork and teachings around the world. They're all teaching this same profound and beautiful and empowering message with different symbols and different characters and different surface aspects to the story. In the Phrygian story of from ancient Anatolia, modern day Turkey, the story of Attis and the goddess Sibeli or Kaibeli. It is also celebrated at this time of year in the ancient traditions, the Hilaria, sacred to the goddess Sibeli, and reenacting the death and resurrection of Attis was celebrated right around the March equinox. In fact, the whole festival was built around the time just starting at the March equinox and then going on after the March equinox, just like we're celebrating Easter, the death and resurrection of a Christ figure at the exact same time. He suffers all these humiliations, but Addis rises again. It is the same pattern. These are celestial metaphor teaching the same deep truths with different symbolism and different superficial characteristics to the stories, but not superior to one another. They're just different manifestations of this ancient pattern. But the literalist Christian interpretation is everybody else has falsehood. And then that idea didn't spread because, oh yes, Christianity's stories are better than everybody else's stories. It spread because of the superiority in applying organized violence. That's how Europe was converted to Christianity, literalist Christianity, by organized violence. Westerners often forget this fact. Non-Westerners never do. Now, the chopping down of the tree, by the way, when Jesus is taken down from the cross, it's very much similar to when Osiris, the he's encased in a tree and he's handed over to the goddess Isis, it's very much a parallel to the body of Jesus being given to Mary in the depictions of the crucifixion scene. And in fact, if you go and look in the book of Acts and in the letter to the Galatians that I referenced earlier, Jesus is described as being hanged on a tree, 
It's the same pattern over and over around the world. The ancient myths are about healing of trauma on an individual level and on a societal level, they're about opposition to oligarchy. In the stories of the Bible, Hello, Maggie. Hello there. The ancient wisdom is not just about healing trauma on an individual level, but also on a societal level. The ancient myths talk about opposition to oligarchy, and I've spoken about this in many previous videos. But in the ministry of Jesus, as it is preserved in the scriptures, these stories, he starts off by opening up the scroll of Isaiah and reading the passage about the day of Jubilee, the acceptable day of the Lord's favor. That's the day of cancellation of debts. You can find that in Luke chapter 4, verse 19. And it's echoing a passage from Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 2 to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord, which is about cancellation of debts. Now, how does that relate to oligarchy? Oligarchy means gobbling up the resources that are given by the gods for a nation. And if you don't have cancellation of debts, as Professor Hudson explains, in antiquity, if you didn't have cancellation of debts, eventually people's lands would get gobbled up by the creditors. If I loan money to a farmer while he plants his crops and he's going to pay me back when the crops come in, but then there's a war or there's a drought or there's some other disaster, a pestilence, a COVID, huh, sorry, a pestilence, and the crops that were anticipated don't come in, now that farmer is in debt, can't pay it back, he has to go work on the lands of another instead of on his own, and he's in danger of having his lands seized because he can't pay that debt back, and eventually creditors are going to gobble up and put one piece of land against another until they own everything. This is talked about in the scriptures of the Bible. In the ancient Old Testament scriptures, it's talked about woe to them that gobble up the lands of others. And to prevent that, a jubilee year is put in place. And that jubilee year, as Professor Hudson explains, is part of an ancient pattern in ancient Mesopotamia. The Code of Hammurabi shows the cancellation of debts, not just once during the reign of Hammurabi, but several times. He also points out that the Rosetta Stone of ancient Egypt, the famous Rosetta Stone, it's all about a cancellation of debt. That's what the actual text of the Rosetta Stone in four different scripts and different languages is explaining a cancellation of debts. It's a proclamation of a jubilee, basically. That's the Rosetta Stone. But why don't you know that? Because in the later Greek period, when they started to turn against the gods, turn against the ancient pattern, oligarchs said, we don't want to forgive debts, because if we did that, we'd have to give back all these lands that we seized. Let's get rid of the ancient system. And in later Greece and Rome, oligarchs stood against the ancient pattern of cancellation of debts. And that's the tension that was starting to erupt in the ancient world. And eventually, the oligarchs won out. And to enforce the messed up system of oligarchy requires what? Organized crime, organized violence. The, the powerful oligarch said, we don't want a central authority that can cancel debts. We don't want that. We want debts to be in our control and enable us to gobble up other people's property. That's what we want in the resources of the land. And so in order to enforce that system, they had to be better at applying violence than 
the central government that wanted to cancel the debts to keep to reset the system when it got out of balance. And so that is why the West is not just associated with this literalist Christian program, but also with applying organized violence. Literalist Christianity was the overthrow of the ancient system. It said, oh no, this isn't about prevention of oligarchy and recovery of trauma. This is about literal flesh and blood people. And if you don't believe in them, then we have to enforce your conversion at the point of a sword. It's all connected, both on the individual level and the societal level. And so I hope that that concept that I just explained is coherent. At this time of Easter is the perfect time to reconsider these ancient beautiful stories. The stories of the Bible are beautiful, just like all the other ancient myths of the world. Not superior, but they're all teaching these profound truths about overcoming trauma on an individual level and on a societal level. And we can incorporate those today. This ancient pattern is actually essential to both individual happiness and societal happiness. And so on this Easter, on this Easter 2024, I wish blessings and thank you so much for listening.